Um, today we're going to cover chapter 11 out of our textbook, Pipe Welding Procedures. Uh, this is an introduction to welding metallurgy. We start on page 170. Chapter is about 30 pages long. It's pretty concise. doesn't cover everything, not nearly everything that has to do with welding uh, metallurgy, but it does cover the, the basics of it. As we're going through this thing, I'll be asking you to highlight certain portions and to uh, put a bullet by various questions uh, um, and statements and such. And those of, will be where the questions will probably come from. These are the important points. Typically, I, I'll have you put more bullets than we'll ask questions. This test will be 20 to 30 questions long when we're, when we're done. Um, if you look at the board here, welding metallurgy, let's start with the definition of welding metallurgy. Welding metallurgy is concerned with the changes occurring in metals during welding, as opposed to uh, basic welding metallurgy, which comes into play in the foundry. We talk about a little bit of it as well. Uh, let me read from your book. This is the second paragraph on page 170. Metals have distinguishing characteristics that are important to know. In the solid state, they exist in the form of crystals, and they can be deformed plastically. Uh, all metals are good conductors of heat and electricity and have a metallic luster that readily reflects light. Uh, most commercial metals are not pure metals. They are usually a mixture of metals called alloys. And what they'll do, let's take carbon steel for example. We're welding with mild steel. It's typically, uh, it's typically has a carbon content of, of 0 0.15 to 0. Uh, 2 zero, that would be a 1020 carbon steel. And what they'll do with it, they'll refine the iron ore down to pure iron, and we'll show a slide of that here in a little bit. And once they get all the impurities out at the smelter, they have nothing in there except pure iron, then they will add back certain amounts of carbon, uh, which is, has the greatest inf effect of, of any of the alloying elements on steel. And then sometimes they'll put molybdenum in it, or chromium in it, or vanadium, various alloying elements, which we'll discuss a little more in depth here later on. But they render it down to a clean, pure, homogeneous mixture before they start adding those things back. And those are all called uh, alloyed steels. And you have your, your low, low carbon, low alloy steels, and your high strength, low alloy steels. And again, we'll get into those a little bit later. In that first introduction section, um, Reading the, near the end of that paragraph, it, it, it says, plain carbon steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. Alloy steels contain additions of other alloying elements, including chromium, tungsten, vanadium, nickel, etc., depending on what types of properties they want to enhance. Uh, the properties of complex metal alloys can best be learned by first studying the basic concepts of metallurgy. Uh, properties of metal. Okay, there, are, there are five main properties of metal. Let's put them over here out of the way. Strength is probably the most important one. Then you have ductility, and I can't find a pencil that's writing. There we go. Uh, ductility, hardness, toughness, and fatigue strength. It's important to note that fatigue strength uh, is related to notch toughness and it's also known as impact strength. So these are the properties of metal. Strength, ductility, hardness, toughness, and fatigue. So I don't think your book actually lists them like that. Uh, they start listing on the, ex, uh, on the next couple of pages, and there'll be a little blurb of each one. Let's see, go to page 171. Strength, this is the definition of strength, the ability of a material to bear an applied load. Um, if you look on page 172, where it says strength, uh, they define it as the strength of the metal from which a part is made depends on the load it must carry, its size, and its shape. 
This is a much, much more concise definition, the ability of a material to, to bear an applied load. And that could be applied in a lot of different ways. Your book talks about uh, compressive strength, uh, tensile, shear strength, and torsional shear. These are all different ways that a load can be applied. If, if we're dealing with a bridge, for example, well, that would be compressive strength because you've got the pillars holding up the bridge uh, with your cars and trucks and everything going across. So the pressure is being placed down. So this would be a compression type of strength. If we do tensile tests, now we're applying a tensile load, and we will be pulling this apart. And so this would be a tensile strength. Um, a torsional, if you look here uh, in figure 11-1, uh, torsional would be where they have this gear in there, and they're putting it on, uh, offset a little bit, and they're putting pressure on it. So they're, they're, they're trying to shear it off this way. This would be a torsional. And then shear would be, as, as that diagram in there shows, would be something like this, where you would have something, a plate coming out maybe, and, and a load uh, stacked on here. And so this would be, it'd be pushing down on this, on this uh, member, this horizontal member here, and this would be a shear type of, type of strength. So the load can be applied in a lot of different ways. Um, So we need, to, we need to know what stress is. Okay. What happens when we, uh, when we apply a load, we create stress. And this is a stress-strain diagram. It shows a stress-strain stress curve. And if you take any of these that we've talked about here and, and we put it under load, uh, we're going to subject it to, the, to this stress. Uh, and what that's going to show is uh, the, the, the stress is the applied load. And the strain would be the manifestation of that stress uh, physically into the part. For example, on here, if I clamp this into our, our puller and I subject it to a pulling stress, then it, that stress is going to uh, manifest itself as strain when it starts to pull apart. And it will physically grow. So, the, the stress then would be the, the, the load that I'm putting on it. The strain would be how much it's stretching. And what happens is we can put a certain amount of stress on a piece like this uh, until we reach what is called the yield point. And here, here on this side we show stress and we apply the load. Well, once we, re we reach that yield point then, it gives and it... Uh, its metal properties change from elastic to plastic. Now, what do I mean by, by elastic and plastic? If you look at this rubber band, and uh, just imagine this was steel because it behaves essentially the same. Well, I can put a stress on it, and if I stretch it and stretch it and stretch it, and I continue to put a stress on it, it's going to stretch. Well, metal does the same thing. It'll stretch to a certain point. And if I let off, it'll go back. So that is a demonstration of elastic behavior. Now, we change from elastic to plastic when I put so much stress on it that I snap it, that it breaks apart. That would be the metal's yield point. And at that point, it goes from elastic, because it will not return to the way it was, to plastic, what they call plastic deformation. So uh, on page 171, where it says, stress is defined as the load per unit area. That's a bullet. And then know, that, know the different types of stresses that something can be subjected to. And it's listed there at the bottom of, of that page. You have compressive, tensile, shear, and torsional shear stresses. Uh, then flip the page. And let's uh, talk about strain. I talked about it a little bit. If you look here on, on page 172 where it says strain, I want you to put two bullets in this paragraph. Go to the middle of the paragraph where it says technically, and highlight this, technically, strain is the distance each unit length of metal is changed as a load is applied. So as it's stretching, we're, that strain is becoming visible. So we're putting that strain on there, and you can actually see it. And then uh, drop on down to the last sentence in that paragraph and highlight that and put a bullet by it. It says strain then alludes to the elastic movement of the metal when a load is applied, whereas stress... Alludes, uh, alludes to the resistance to that movement. So we put it under stress, 
and then it's manifested as strain and we can actually see it. So that, that is how we get our stress strain diagram. Strength, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a bullet. Know what the definition of strength is and I would like you to use the definition that I had on the board. Uh, that's probably the shape that the question is going to take and it is the uh, material's ability to, uh, to uh, carry an applied load and that load can be applied compressively, torsionally, uh, shear or tinsel, tinselly. If you look at the next page, strength has two common expressions, two ways that it is expressed. expressed. Ultimate tensile strength or UTS and yield strength, the point at which it will yield from and go from elastic to plastic. Uh, UTS, ultimate tensile strength, that's a bullet. Um, you'll find those on, on uh, well procedure qualification records. This, is a, this happens to be a, a welding procedure that I qualified, uh, actually it was on 12-12-07 uh, I qualified this procedure. And to qualify that procedure we had to take some test specimens like this, machine them down, and then we put them in our uh, tinsel puller and we pulled them about, apart and we recorded the ultimate load, ultimate total load. That is how much did this area support? And in this particular t test, it took 10,600 pounds to pull this thing apart. It was a smaller specimen than this, so, uh, but that's how much it took. Then we use a, a, a simple formula and compute the ultimate tensile strength, and that's here. Ultimate stress, or PSI per square inch, and it turned out to be 74,100 on one specimen and 73,900 on the other. So we express the strength of the base material in the ultimate tensile strength. Um, yield strength is also a bullet. Um, go to there and highlight that where it says in machines and structures the metal must not deform permanently when subject to a load. For this reason the yield strength is often reported. This is a bullet. The yield strength is the stress to which a metal can be subjected without permanent deformation. So we can, we can put it under load and we can stress it, but it's not going to fail. It's not going to go from elastic to plastic on us. So that's a bullet. So that would be your yield strength. Um, it's expressed two ways. Let's see. I might have this slide out of, out of, out of, out of place a little bit. So, but let me talk about it anyway. I've talked about elastic and plastic. If it, if it shows an elastic behavior, it, it, it exhibits no permanent deformation. That is, once we take the, the load off of it, the, we remove the, the stress, it will go back to its normal shape. If, if we go beyond that, then it goes to, to plastic deformation or it's permanent, permanently deformed. If you look at this thing, what we'll do, if we were to stretch this thing and stretch and stretch and stretch it until it failed, we would deform this, uh, and that is, it changes from, uh, from being square, it's going to neck down, and it's also going to grow. So it's going to be what we call a ductile failure. It'll stretch out a little bit, and then it'll eventually fail. And that's two ways of, of calculating uh, uh, ductility, which we'll get to in just a minute. So make a note, elastic, no permanent deformation, plastic, permanent deformation. Um, on hardness, down at the bottom, that's also a bullet. Hardness is defined as the ability of a material to resist indentation. That's our definition with our slides. These slides, incidentally, come from a, from a different text, if you haven't guessed already. This comes from our welding inspection technology class. The wording's just about the same, but if you look in your book, it says hardness is defined as the resistance to penetration. Well, again, this is a little more succinct explanation. Ability to resist indentation what they'll do is they'll take an indenter like this and they'll put it under a certain load and they can read that load on a graph and once they put that load on there they'll back it off and then they'll take and they'll actually measure the size of the indenture and from that they can tell uh, what its hardness is. So that would be a hardness test. Uh, flip the page to 174, bullet, hardenability. This property is related to the depth below the surface to which a metal can be hardened. It does not relate to the maximum hardness that can be achieved in a given metal. There are several standard tests for, for hardenability. 
uh, with perhaps the hominy in quenchness quench hardability test being the most popular. That's a mouthful. But what they'll do on that test is they'll take a bar, and it's really about as big as this, and they'll, they'll heat it to a certain temperature, and then they'll put it under a water jet, and they can calculate the heat, uh, pardon me, the, the, the hardness after this uh, by checking it in different areas, and they can come up with different har uh, the different hardnesses for the different uh, sections, it, because as you quench it, if you quench it, you change the metal structure, so it's going to be hard as tap down here, uh, and they would case harden this on the outside, and then it's going to get softer and softer and be more ductile as, it, as they move away from that, from that end. And this would be the uh, hominy quench, in quench hard, hardenability test. And I mention that because that is a question on your test. They're going to want to know what that is. Um, ductility is also a bullet. Um, I, again, I like my abbreviations here. The ability of a metal to deform without breaking is ductility. We want metals to be able to give a little bit. Uh, we don't want a really rigid metal. Uh, if it's rigid, it will fail what they, uh, brittly. They call it failing, failing brittly. We would rather have it deform a little bit before it fails. Uh, because everything has to, typically everything that you're going to weld is going to be under some kind of vibratory stress. And if it didn't have any ductility, it would just snap. So if we have some ductility, it's able to absorb that stress in the form of strain, and it'll flex a little bit, but it won't fail. So we want to have a little bit of ductility. Ductility is very important. So bullet by ductility, and also a bullet in the next paragraph where it seeds, reads, ductility is generally defined as percent elongation and percent reduction of area. Percent elongation and per percent reduction of area. Well, what's that mean? As, as I mentioned earlier, if I were to pull this apart, as it's stretching, this area in here is going to become thinner because it has some ductility to it. So it's going to get thin until it finally snaps. Um, so this would be our, our reduction of area because this area is going to become smaller. And percent of elongation, to, to measure that, what we would do, we would, we would stamp this specimen with a couple of punch marks and then we would measure it before we pull it apart. Once we pull it apart, we would put the two ends back together and take a second measurement, and that will show us how far this thing stretched before it finally failed. And that would be our percent of elongation. And uh, we can actually turn that into a percentage. And you'll, if you get into metals uh, a little bit, you will find uh, that they list those per, uh, percent of elongation on test specimens whenever they pour, pour samples. <clears throat> you'll see them on MTRs, mill test reports and such. So remember those two terms. Percent elongation, percent reduction of area, and they are related to ductility. <clears throat> uh, this is the calculation. I don't know if you guys would be interested in this. It's not going to be on your test, but if you needed to calculate the percent of elongation, this is the formula that, that you would use. Uh, percentage of e elongation equals the final length minus the original length times 100 divided by the original length. And here the uh, their original length was 2 inches. When they got done with it, it was 2.6 inches times 100 divided by 2 equaled 30%. So they had a 30% elongation on this particular uh, example. <clears throat> Reduction of area, you take the original area uh, and, and then you got your final area. So the formula would be the original area minus the final area times 100 divided by the original area. And in this case, it had a uh, percent reduction of area of 50 percent. So these are high, they're simple formulas and this is how you would use them if you if you needed to determine that. <clears throat> you won't be asked those questions but uh, I wanted to show that to you. Our next property is toughness. Toughness. I love again the, the, the simple little uh, uh, definitions. Toughness is defined as the ability of a material to absorb energy. <clears throat> so the, the way your book defines it, and of course it's a bullet, the ability of a metal to withstand a sudden shock is toughness. Um, this property is determined by the energy absorbed when a notched specimen is struck by a hammer blow delivered by a swinging pendulum. Well, this, here they're talking about a notch, a notched specimen. So now they're, they're, they're actually getting these two uh, a little more related than they actually are. Uh, this, what they're talking about is notched toughness, and we could just as easily put notched toughness or impact strength into that one. Uh, 
Uh, and, and the way they do this, this, this test that he's talking about, if you look here at the board, I'm sorry, this is, this is, this is a toughness comparison. Uh, uh, this is a stress-strain diagram that we, uh, th that's here for mild steel and monel. And all it's showing here is that we would have greater, a greater amount of toughness if we added a little uh, monel to the steel instead of just mild steel. So it just, that's all that one is. But let's see, notch toughness. And this is a better definition. So you notice the definitions are a little different. Notch toughness is toughness in the presence of surface notches and rapid loading. So remember that one. Notch toughness differs from, from just regular, regular toughness. If you go back here to this definition of toughness, the ability to absorb energy, notch toughness is, the, is, the, is toughness in the presence of notches and rapid loading. And it's also referred to as impact strength, and you're probably going to hear that more than anything else. So make a note of impact strength. Write it off in the margin someplace. Know what impact strength is. So how do they test for that? This is what he's talking about here, where the book says they, uh, they determine it by, by uh, using a, a notched specimen and striking it by a hammer. This is called a Sharpie test. And these are little, little blocks of material that have been, been welded up. And you can see that they put a little V-notch into them. And they'll do these in sets of three. And they set them in a, in a, in a, in a Sharpie test specimen, uh, tester. And you can see the pendulum here. This is a testing machine. And they can bring this pendulum up, and of course it's just gravity assist, and they can measure the foot pounds that it's going to strike the specimen down here with. And they'll, they'll swing that hammer down, and they'll strike it on the back side here, and they'll split this. And they'll notice what kind of a failure occurred. And they'll do these, as I say, in a set of three at different temperatures. And that way they can det determine how that material is going to hold up uh, under various conditions. Uh, typically, they might go 40 degrees below zero. They, uh, they might go zero, and they might go 40 degrees above zero. So they've got three specimens from three different temperatures because cold has a direct effect on, on metal properties, as you guys probably know. And here, here are some of these uh, specimens that were done in that manner. And what we have is, uh, back here, you have a real fine, coarse specimen that shattered. This would be what's called a brittle failure. It did not exhibit any ductility before it failed. It just snapped. It, it, uh, a knowledge to this would be taking a, a file and smacking it on the side of a table, and it's just going to shatter. That is a, brill, uh, a brittle failure. And that was done at 40 degrees. Then as they move up here at 20 degrees below zero, you see it's a little, it's a little more coarse, which showed that we had a little tiny bit of ductility before it failed, but it still, again, it, it, it shattered pretty good. Then here at zero degrees, if you look along the edges up here, now it tore just a little bit before it failed. Here at 20 degrees up, up, above zero, it, now we're getting, we're getting some ears here, which, and we're getting some ripples here, which showed that it took a little more uh, uh, to, to, to make it fail, and so it tore a little bit before it finally failed. And here at 40, these are a little dark, but you've got real long ears. Uh, here, which indicates that the thing actually stretched a little bit before it failed, and so this would be a, called a ductile failure because it exhibited the highest amount of ductility. So we're going from brittle all the way to ductile failure, and that's the importance of, of impact strength on, on a material. Uh, and it's, it, impact strength is always in the presence of some kind of a notch, um, and a notch could be um, just about anything, a bolt. If you put a bolt, the threads on the bolt would, would, would present a notch. Um, excess weld reinforcement. Let me find my eraser here. Some typical notches that we run into in welding, which as a welding inspector you cannot allow, would be we've, 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 we've got a weld here, and we have excessive weld reinforcement. If it's over an eighth of an inch, or more importantly, if it's more of a straight line, this presents a notch. So this would fail more readily than a weld that had a smooth transition because we don't have a notch in this. Another one would be if we had a weld uh, that exhibited some undercut right there. This undercut would present a notch. These are just two examples of notches. Uh, and if you have a notch on the inside of a pipe, it's even worse. So this is why no internal undercut is allowed at all. 
So these would be notches that could cause a failure. It's, you know, and if you have a failure in a pressure retaining part, who knows what, what can happen. So notch toughness is very important. Um, failure in the presence of notches under vibratory stress uh, occur all the time. And they're the number one failure, uh, reason for failure of most, weld, most welds. They'll develop into cracks and then go on and fail. So uh, know about impact strength. Uh, let's see. Brittleness, okay, well I unintentionally talked a little bit about brittleness uh, when, I showed, when I showed the different uh, types of failure on those Sharpie tests. We went from a brittle failure to a ductile failure. So what's brittleness? The property refers to the ease with which a metal will crack or break without appreciable deformation. Brittleness is related to hardness. As a metal gets harder, its brittleness also increases. And as the metal is made softer, its brittleness decreases. So it's, it's, it's uh, hardness without any ductility. So, so we, we would prefer to have some ductility there. Malleability, also a bullet. Malleability is, is the property that relates to the ability of a metal to be permanently deformed by compression, usually by rolling or hammering. Most ductile metals are also malleable. Um, one example would be if you've ever seen a movie or seen it in in shop, they'll, they'll have a hammer, uh, an automatic hammer coming down and they'll take a piece of, piece of material and they'll pound it and then they'll roll it a little bit and they'll pound it some more and they'll roll it a bit, trying to get a specific shape. Okay, that, that piece of material that they're working on is malleable. Uh, another way you get malleability is by rolling it, uh, rolling a piece of material. When material comes out at the, at the uh, mill uh, uh, where it's being cast, they'll take these ingots, melt them down, roll it out and then uh, pour it out and then they, they'll draw it through rolls. And what happens with, with rolls is it adds what's called directional properties. If you look at this, and I don't think that's very clear, this takes place at the mill. And what you do is you have a, a wide piece of metal, in this example it's two inches wide, and they'll put, they're putting it through some rollers. So this material is malleable because they're compressing it and down to one inch. But because they, they are compressing it through rollers, it has directional properties. Our, our, x, our x position, x direction, which would be lengthwise, has the best strength and the best ductility. The y direction, which is across, has 10 to 30 percent less strength and 20 to 50 percent less ductility. And then finally the through section, which would only be one inch, has lower strength and ductility uh, even further. So rolling it uh, imparts directional properties. So that's what I, this is not in your book. Make a note of it. This will be a question on your test. Directional properties. And it's going to be something to the effect of which of the following X, Y, or Z has the, uh, exhibits the best strength and ductility. So know about your, your, your uh, uh, directional properties. If you're out there in, in, in your job and you're doing a repair and something keeps failing, well it may, be, it may keep failing because you're, you're laying it in the wrong direction. Uh, I had a direct experience with this one time. I had to go up to Montana and test a bunch of welders and, and they kept, their, their welds kept failing. And they kept failing and they were good welds. They shouldn't have failed. And what, what I found on further inspection was that they had the coupons, test coupons ready for me when I got there. But what they had done, they had cut the, the test coupons this way. And so we flipped them together, we, we made the welds well, it had less strength and less ductility, and so they were failing. They, what they should have done is gone, gone and cut them like this, and then we would have had the maximum amount of strength and ductility. So uh, I've seen it, it's real, it's out there, and it may impact your job. So keep the directional property, and even on a 4 by 8 sheet of plate, for example, it's still going to have directional properties, so keep directional properties in mind. Um, directional properties. Both strength and ductility are affected by the, the rolling direction of the metal on the three axes are the X, Y, and Z directions. Next, fatigue strength. In your book it's called fatigue. It's a bullet. Highlight from about the center of that paragraph where it reads, from these tests the endurance limit of a metal can be determined which is defined as the stress below which the metal will withstand an indefinitely large number of cycles of stresses without failure. What they're talking about in this paragraph is 
they have to establish its endurance limit. That's a bullet. Know what the term endurance limit means. It would mean that I could take this thing and I could put it in a jig and I could, I could pull it back and forth and twist it and, and whatever from here until the sun sets on the last day of, of humanity on earth and it would still sit there and just be okay. That's its endurance limit. And they will subject it over and over and over again to these stresses. Um, of course, if, if, if they exceed the, the, its ability, then it's going to fail. So, also highlight where it says fractures due to fatigue are often the result of sharp corners, scratches on the surface of the metal, or tool marks. So even something as simple as that can lead to a failure. So on this particular specimen, uh, this was machined down, but they didn't quite get it all the way down. So over time, if this was subjected to a continuous repetitive vibration or some kind of stress, it could fail at this point um, because surface notches do have a direct effect on its, on its uh, fatigue strength. So know about fatigue, know about particularly endurance limit, and also know that notch toughness can also be considered impact strength. So toughness, fatigue strength, notch toughness, impact strength, they're all related. Okay. If you have questions, please feel free to find me and ask me. Um, endurance limit. Again, I like my, my uh, definitions a little bit better. Endurance limit is the maximum stress at which no failure will occur regardless of the number of cycles. No matter how long they do it, it's going to hold up. A stress riser, I talked a little bit about uh, too high a cap, surface geometry of the weld, those are stress risers. Um, and what happens is a surface condition or geometric feature that increases the applied stress at the condition or the geometry. So that's where the, the stress is going to be concentrated, that's where a crack will appear. So know what a stress riser is. That'll be on your test. And at this point, I would ask for questions, but I'm doing this to uh, an empty classroom, I'm afraid to say. So no questions will be taken. All right. Let's go over to the next page, 175, grain structure. You can borrow your pen for just a minute. That's a pin that's dysfunctional. Okay, so grain structure. Let's read from your book here, page 175. Atomic structure, here we have a, a simple uh, uh, lattice, cubic lattice. It says, in the solid state, metals are in the form of crystals called grains. Some of the grains can be quite large and can be seen by the naked eye. However, most grains are very small and require powerful magnification to be seen. Um, the crystals are composed of a more or less orderly arrangement of atoms called a lattice structure. Each atom is in a fixed position. This is, that is, it oscillates about a fixed position. And uh, what they'll do, each one of these will sit here, and they, and they have an internal energy, and they sit there and vibrate in what are called their home positions in a solid. As you dump more energy into them, for, for example, from welding or cutting, anything like that, you add to the energy of that atom and they vibrate more and more and more, bumping against their neighbors. If we continue adding more and more energy to it, they'll become more excited until eventually it turns into a liquid and they lose their home positions. Um, atoms, atomic structures, atom uh, matter is made up of atoms. Atoms are very small. Electrons orbit uh, the atomic nuclei. They have a home location in solids and they oscillate around that home location. Here are some uh, common crystal structures. Uh, pay attention to these. They're on your, in your book. The four basic unit cells in metals. Metals are composed of four basic unit cells, which are shown in figure 11.3. Um, for example, chromium and tungsten have a body-centered cubic structure. Iron, when below 1666 Fahrenheit, and steel, uh, when below... Uh, 1660 to 1333 have a body-centered cubic structure. 
Aluminum, copper, nickel, silver, and gold have a face-centered cubic structure. You'll notice that those are your uh, uh, non-ferrous metals, non-magnetic. Uh, they would have a face-centered cubic structure. Uh, when iron is above 1666 and plain carbon steel is above 1333 to 1666, they're giving that range because of the amount of carbon in the, in the material. That's why they're giving you a range. They have a face-centered cubic structure. Uh, depending on its composition, steel may be partially face-centered cubic and partially body-centered cubic. Uh, the hard component of steel called, called martensite that has been formed by heating and quenching has a body-centered tetragonal uh, structure. So pay attention to these. If you see a question, you're, it's probably going to be something to the effect of which one of these would be uh, related to iron and steel. Well, we'd probably go with a body-centered cubic and a face-centered cubic. Um, let's see. Flip the page. Crystal structured. Uh, Body-centered cubic. FCC face-centered cubic, HCP hexagonal close-packed, and BCT uh, body-centered tetragonal. Those are the four different basic ones. Then we have uh, on page 176, hi highlight and put a bullet by where it says, it will be noted from the above that iron still have two structures or phases depending on their temperature. This important fact makes it possible to harden steel by heat treating. Uh, when steel is cooled slowly, it will transpose from one structure to another without difficulty, and it's called a phase change. So what they have is, when you're up there, Ew. oops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that. There we go. Phases in steel, depending on the temperature and the amount of, of carbon in it, you can have these different steel structures. And in, in uh, sorry, button's not cooperating. And so depending on the amount of carbon and the temperature, iron could be either one of these. And, and what can happen is these, these structures can form and they can go ahead and change as the temperature, it's like, a, it's like an ice crystal cooling off. Uh, and it, it can change, it can change shape as the temperature changes. Um, you can achieve all kinds of different properties through heat treatment just by controlling the rate of cooling. Uh, cooling rates, if you have a slow cooling rate, you'll form uh, a structure called perlite, which has the softest structure. Most of the uh, carbon steel that we use in the Welly Lab has a perlite structure to it. A little faster, it's a little harder, uh, and we, we get bainite. And really fast, we get martensite, which is the hardest. We'll talk more about these in just a minute. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Um, staying on page 176, drop down to that last paragraph. Highlight where it says, metals are actually an aggregate of crystals or grains, as shown in figure 11.4. Uh, each grain is surrounded by other grains, except at the surface of the metal. When polished and etched with a suitable agent and then viewed under a microscope, the grains can clearly be seen. Any of you that have taken Paul Johnson's metallurgy class, he's probably shown you some samples of that. Over on the next page, uh, highlight the last sentence, pardon me, the last paragraph, and put a bullet by it where it says, the grains in an alloy may or may not appear to be identical. In many alloys, different kinds of grains exist side by side um, in a structure, in a structure. The structure of a metal uh, when viewed under a, the microscope is called its microstructure. So that's a bullet. Know what microstructure means. Uh, microstructures. Uh, metals are composed of grains or crystals. They're very small. They're separated by grain boundaries. And they actually consider grain boundaries to be uh, discontinuities because it's an interruption in the, in the nature of the, of, of the material. And there are different phases within grains. We just talked about how it can change phase as it's cooling. Uh, okay. The different phases are ferrite, cementite, austenite, bainite, perlite, and martensite. Ferrite on page one seventy seven bullet. Uh, this is a solid solution of a very small percentage of carbon and iron. 
This is a microstructure of iron. And when I talked earlier about, they'll take and, and they'll refine the ore down to pure iron. And this is as pure as you can get. Uh, but you can still see these, these grain structures, these grain boundaries in here. What they'll do is they'll take, take the ore down to this and then they'll add back whatever amount of carbon or uh, vanadium or silicone or whatever else they want to put in there to uh, get some of their properties. The other way they get their properties is by adding, uh, is by heating it up uh, uh, to the uh, uh, transition range and then bringing, di bringing it down to different temperatures and we'll talk about that in a second. Cementite, staying on page 177, is an iron carbide. It's a compound of iron and carbon. Uh, it's very hard in wear resistance. Its composition will be varied when other carbide forming alloys are present in steel. Let's see if I have another picture. This is perlite, and its, it's appearance is lamellar. That is, it's layered. You can see various layers of ferrite and cementite. So it takes ferrite and cementite. When you have that in this layered uh, arrangement, you'll have, uh, you'll have perlite. And it's got good ductility. This is a bullet. It says, this is a very fine plate-like structure consisting of thin plates of ferrite sandwiched together uh, with thin plates of cementite. Um, when the steel is cooled slowly, the perlite is coarse. It becomes finer as the cooling rate is increased. Perlite is a very strong and tough structure and adds to the strength and toughness of steel. The amount of perlite in plain carbon steel increases until a maximum is reached at approximately 0.8% carbon. Um, and they're, they'll they're, they're telling you the maximum. And if, if here in a bit, we're going to get to a uh, phase change diagram. And at that, we, uh, we, we, that is the defining line between what's called a, a uh, hyper-eutectoid and a, and a hypo-eutectoid steels. So above it, you would have a hyper-eutectoid steel. Below 0.8% carbon, you would have a hypo uh, eutectoid steels. And it's, you're really reaching the saturation point at that, at that time. If you've ever taken salt and tried to dissolve it in a glass of water, you can push, pour salt in, stir it, and it'll dissolve. Pour some more, it'll stir it, it'll dissolve. Eventually, you're going to reach a point to where you can pour all the salt in there you want to, and it's not going to dissolve anymore. You'll just see the grains of salt swirling around inside the water. That water has absorbed as much salt as it possibly can. So you've reached its saturation point. Uh, same thing happens here. Uh, until the perlite in the plain carbon steels reaches that maximum of 0.8 percent. Martensite. This is a this is a picture of martensite. It's a little more clear than the one that's in your book, and you can see it's kind of a needle-like arrangement. Uh, I believe they call that acular, uh, needle-like, and it's very hard, uh, but it's very brittle. So you've got good wear resistance here. And what happens is they lock it, they cool it so fast, usually by quenching, that they lock in the crystals before they can transform to a softer matrix. So martensite is a bullet, and it says this, this structure results when steel with a relatively high carbon content is cooled very rapidly. Small amounts of martensite may ob be obtained by quenching a steel having a lower carbon content. The addition of alloys to steel makes it possible to obtain martensite at lower cooling rates. Uh, martensite has a body-centered tectagonal structure in which carbon atoms are trapped. Martensite is a very hard and brittle structure. Usually it is tempered, uh, forming a structure called tempered martensite, which is body-centered cubic. Tempered martensite becomes increasingly soft as the temperature, uh, tempering temperature is increased. And then finally here we have uh, Widman statin structure. And uh, what that is, this is a bullet. It, it happens with welling, and it says this structure occurs in the weld zone of mild steels having a relatively low carbon content. So in our mild steels that we weld in, in, in the welding lab, uh, we would have it in, 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 in the weld zones uh, of the steel because it has a relatively low carbon content. Uh, about the lowest steels you can use uh, would have a 0.03% carbon. Uh, a woodman statin structure is less ductile and has lower impact strength than ordinary ferrite. On the next page, austenite. This is a face-centered cubic formed of iron occurring in plain carbon steels at temperatures above 1333, which we'll look at on a face diagram here in a minute. Spheroid, spheroidite. Uh, this structure consists of many small spheroidal-shaped particles of cementite dispersed in the ferrite. Uh, bainite is another structure uh, that can occur in steel. 
it may have either a feathery or a secular appearance, that's that needle-like. Uh, bainite is produced by quenching steel from an elevated temperature to a temperature above about 400 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the composition of the steel, and holding the steel at this temperature for a long time. Um, it does not normally occur as a result of welding. Ones I would like you to remember here would be ferrite, cementite, perlite, martensite, and uh, Widmanstaten structure. Okay, here we have an iron carbon phase diagram. Now, if you look on page 181, they've shown a portion of this. Yeah, they've shown a portion of this up in here. They're not really giving you the temperatures along the side here. 1333 is the lower transformation range. Um, this, doesn't, this shows 1600, 1666 would be right here. And depending, if you look here, hypoeutectoid and hyperutectoid depends on the percent of carbon. So if you have 0 to 0.8% 0 carbon, we have a hypoeutectoid. Above that would be hyperutectoid. And depending on how much carbon is in there, you heat it up, you're going to get these different grain structures in the steel. And what they'll do is they'll heat them up to these, to, to these temperatures, and then, as I've said before, uh, they'll essentially become liquid, and then as they cool them off, depending on how rapidly they cool them, off, cool them off and the amount of carbon in them, they can create different phases. Perlite, uh, perlite and ferrite, perlite and cementite, and uh, they can lock in different properties depending on how fast they, they bring the, those temperatures down. If you look on page 181, put a bullet by and highlight the second paragraph where it says the iron carbon diagram illustrates the temperatures at which the different constituents in an iron carbon alloy exist under equilibrium conditions. It is a most useful tool in predicting the final structure of these steels. Well, I'm not going to expect you to memorize this, uh, but know what it is. So this paragraph right here will give you an idea of what a what an, um, phase diagram is. Then flip the page and, and highlight the last sentence on that topic where it says, similarly, it is possible to predict the structure of other com compositions of iron and carbon from the di this diagram when they are cooled slowly, which is what we're going to talk about next. <clears throat> um, now, at this point, we're going to slice in um, a quick and easy way of understanding how these different phases, phases are, are, are created. Um, earlier, I gave a lecture in another class on, uh, on, on how you can raise the temperature of a metal and bring it down to achieve either ferrite or cementite or martensite. And we're going to splice that in right here. Um, and I think it will give you a clear understanding of what our, our book's trying to tell us about how these different phases uh, are created. Uh, I, 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 one drawback of this particular chapter is that it doesn't really get into how that's done, and I think it's important that people understand that. As I said, this chapter is only 30 pages long, and you can't, I guess they couldn't really address everything. So we're going to splice that in now, watch that portion, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up on page 182, plane, beginning with grain. Uh, when you look at this, this diagram I've done. Now what we have is you can imagine a block of steel and, and we're going to heat it. And right here, this line represents our, where our phase change is going to occur, 1,333 degrees. Now if you remember, I said if we're above that, the material will be non-magnetic. If we're below that, the material will be magnetic. Below 1,333 degrees, we have a body-centered cubic form. Above it, we have a face-centered cubic form. So above 1,333 degrees, we have an austenitic structure on the steel. Well, what is that? It's iron carbide uh, and, and gamma iron. So the iron carbide dissolves into iron and gamma iron. And uh, 
Gamma iron, I'm going to read from a text. Gamma iron is a crystal form of iron, the atoms of which are arranged in the face-centered cubic lattice. Gamma iron dissolves iron. Its grain size depends on the temperature, time, and degree of working. It is a non-magnetic. Uh, gamma iron is denser than alpha iron. Alpha iron is basic, your basic iron. So <clears throat> when we're going up, we have iron carbide. It dissolves into iron and gamma iron. Depending on how we cool it off, we can get all these different arrangements. We can get perlite, we can get bainite, we can get martensite, or we can get tempered martensite over there on the end. So let's start here with perlite. So we're at 1,333 degrees. Um, in order to get perlite, we're going to slow cool it. And we're going, to bring the, we're going to have iron carbide formed. And our example here is based on the eutectoid steels of 0.8% that are in your book. And my example was of railroad ties or railroad tracks. That is a eutectoid steel. So perlite is, consists, consists of alpha iron and ferrite. So you're going to slow cool it down to perlite. But if we don't want perlite, we just heat it up and we'll go right back up into the austenitic range. Perlite, of course, is, is uh, the softest of the metals that we've discussed. Okay, if we go over here to bainite, all we have to do is give it a slightly faster cool. And because we're cooling it a little bit faster, we're not allowing the, that, that metal structure to, to uh, uh, migrate and, and, and go all the way over to make that change into perlite. So we're kind of locking it in place. And so we get ferrite and iron carbides. So it's going to be a little tougher because iron carbide, as you know, it's, it's, it's three atoms of iron and one of carbon, and they lock together and form these, form these carbides, which are really hard. And so we, we're locking more of them up, and that makes, makes the bainite a little bit harder. Okay. Now over here, if we give it a real fast quench, real fast quench, and you can quench it in oil or water or brine or air, depending on, on what you want, uh, you, you can quench it way down to that martinistic structure that we saw in your textbook. But remember, martensite had that needle-like appearance, and that makes it real brittle. And, and it's not always a very desirable property, but because it has such strength, it is desirable in some applications. So how can you work with it? Well, you work with it by raising it up to just below that, uh, the, our transformation range. We don't want it to switch over to austenite again, so we'll take it up there to about 1,333 degrees, and we'll hold it for a while. So we're baking it for a little while, and that allows some of that stuff to relax, some of those stresses to relax, some of that diffusion to take place, and we're, we're uh, changing, we're breaking down some of that iron carbide, and now we end up with a body-centered tetragonal and a body-centered body cubic. Remember, the body-centered tetragonal is nothing more than a body-centered cubic that's been expanded. When we freeze it, we're locking it in place there, but by relieving that, we'll allow some of those to collapse, and we'll come back to the body center cubic. So we're getting some, some more ductility here uh, while still retaining the hardness of the body center tetragonal, and that then is called tempered martensite. So those are the different phase changes that can occur, and it all depends on the temperature and the time. Temperature and time. Okay. I wish you were here so I could ask you if you had any questions. I'm sorry that you're not, but that's okay. Uh, if you have anything that we're not clear on, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to answer it. Okay, welcome back. Grain size, page 182. Grain size, the effects. If you have fine grained materials, they will have good uh, tensile strength, good ductility, and good low temperature properties. Coarse grain materials have slightly lower strength, are slightly less ductile, and have good high temperature properties. So grain size is very important depending on um, what you're trying to achieve with the material. So let's highlight and put a bullet by where it says, a fine grain size promotes both increased strength and increased ductility in a metal. The grain size in steel may be altered by heat treatment. When it is he heated above certain critical temperatures, a phase change occurs, and new grains would nucleate and grow within the old grains. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but you, you feel free to read it so you get a better understanding. They're talking about different uh, grain sizes that can be created by, uh, by moving through these different critical temperature ranges in a 1020 steel. This is a bullet 
Last sentence in the, on page 182. The microstructure of an AI SI 1020 steel uh, will consist of grains of perlite and ferrite. And the reason I want you to make that a bullet is because I want you to know what AI SI stands for. That is the American Iron and Steel Institute, and that will be a question on your test. They have a real simple, straightforward way of identifying metals. If it's a 10, it's a carbon steel. If it's a 20, it has 0.2% carbon to it. So if you have a 1015 steel, then you have a carbon steel with 0.15% carbon to it. If you have a 1030 steel, then you have a carbon steel with 0.30% carbon to it. So know that AISI stands for American Iron and Steel Institute. Uh, let's go to the next page. The uh, first sentence in the last paragraph under that topic, a highlight and put a bullet by where it says, when depositing a weld, the metal adjacent to the weld is heated and cooled in the manner just described. Uh, the result is that there will be regions of coarse grain size and regions of fi fine grain size uh, adjacent to the weld. So you're going to get both of those structures, and if you'll read and... Uh, Read those previous two pages, you'll get an understanding of how that's created. Then we want to go to alloying elements in steel. Alloying, what's the definition of alloying? Adding elements to change mechanical or physical properties. Um, your book states six um, purposes for doing alloying. To increase the hardenability, to increase strength at ordinary temperatures, to improve high temperature properties, to improve toughness, to increase wear resistance, and to increase corrosion resistance. Um, you'll probably have a question on your test asking you to describe two or three different reasons why we would want to put different alloying elements in steels. So know that these are the six reasons your book gives. Uh, carbon. Well, first of all, here we have elements and steels. Carbon, C, is the most important. And if you'll read under where it says carbon, this would be a bullet. Carbon is the most important and effective alloying element in steel. Each small increase in carbon content increases the hardness and tensile strength of the steel. So it just, it just takes a little bit of carbon uh, to have a dramatic effect on those properties. And uh, hardness and, and tensile strength are directly related in, in most steels. Uh, then we have, well before I go further, let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, common steel alloys, the percentage of carbon and good iron, that would be when they bring it out of the, uh, out of the furnace, um, has excellent, excellent weldability. A low carbon steel, like we use in the welding lab, it's used for electrodes, it's excellent. Mild steel, 15 to 30 percent, structural, good weldability. Medium carbon steels have 0.30 to 0.50. Uh, they're used for machinery type, and it has fair weldability. Now, when we get into this range, anything be above a 0.40, now you've got to start thinking about heat treatment, about heat treating and stress relieving whatever you're welding on because of that hardenability factor. Uh, we don't, if, it, if it gets too hard, what happens? We reduce its ductility. We reduce its ductility. We increase the probability that it can fail under load, under repeated cyclic stresses. Uh, and of course, with a high carbon steel, then spring steels and dies, poor weldability. And here you have to really take precautions against that failure. Um, and it's not just the amount of carbon that's put in there. They have something called a carbon equivalency. As you add like manganese or silicone or vanadium and all these others, uh, they can mimic carbon. So you might have a, a 30 percent, uh, pardon me, three tenths of one percent carbon, but all these others may add, mimic the addition of another half percent. So now suddenly you're up to eight. That would make it equivalent to a high carbon steel, and now you have to think about stress relieving and so forth. And there's a formula for that, and uh, I don't remember if I threw that slide in here or not, but if you want to know that formula, just get with me and I'll let you know. Um, let's go back here. Manganese, it combines with sulfur. Uh, 
in your book here, put a bullet next to carbon. Manganese is probably the most important alloy that is added to steel because it combines with the sulfur to form manganese sulfide. Sulfur, when not combined with manganese, is very harmful. So what, what the manganese does, it, it locks up the sulfur, so it can't cause any hot shortness in the, in the steel. Uh, when combined with, with manganese, the sulfur is harmless. Therefore, manganese is an essential ingredient in all steels. For the purpose of combining with sulfur in quantities ranging from four-tenths of a percent to one percent. When uh, present above this amount, manganese is considered to be an alloying element, and it also acts to deoxidize the steel. Uh, then we have silicone, S, undesire, uh, pardon me, that's sulfur. Silicone, S side, it's a deoxidizer. Bullet, circle deoxidizer. Silicone is one of the principal deoxidizers used in steel. Uh, nickel, nickel's not on there. Where's nickel? Nickel, Ni, increases toughness and ductility. Bullet, nickel is another very important alloying element in steel. When present in appreciable amounts, it improves the toughness and impact resistance of the steel, particularly at lower temperatures. That's a bullet. I believe you'll have a question about nickel on your test. Uh, chromium, down at the bottom, hardenability, corrosion resistance. Uh, chromium increases hardenability and abrasion resistance. When present in quantities in excess of 4%, the corrosion resistance of steel is improved. If it's present in 12% or more, then it becomes a stainless steel. Uh, molybdenum, at the top, moly, hardenability. Bullet, molybdenum, manganese, and chromium um, have a greater effect on hardenability than any other commonly used alloy and element. Molybdenum has a powerful effect in increasing the high temperature strength of a steel, that's a bullet, and it retards grain growth at temperatures above the, the upper critical range. Quench hardened molybdenum, molybdenum steel is fine grained and very tough at all hardness levels. Then we have vanadium, another bullet. The V, hardenability, vanadium is used to inhibit grain growth in steel at elevated temperatures, thereby causing the steel to be fine grained at room temperature, adding to its strength and toughness. Um, tungsten, cobalt, boron, and titanium, they're, they're not as common as these other ones, so I'm not going to go into them. Just, just let me mention about tungsten. Tungsten is used in high-speed tool steels to promote the retention of hardness obtained through heat treatment at high temperatures, and it forms a carbide, a hard carbide for wear resistance. Um, so if you have a tungsten carbide saw blade, that's what they're doing. They're putting these tungsten carbides on there to give it that hardness. Uh, titanium, um, it's used as a deoxidizer and in deep drawing steels to prevent age hardening. It is also used for this purpose in stainless steels and is in, in heat resisting steels to increase their strength. So. Here, your book didn't go into this, so I'm going to mention it real quickly. Somewhere, make a note, this will be on your test. There's two ways that these different alloying atoms sit in the structure of the steel. One is interstitial alloying. Now, if it's interstitial, it means that the alloying elements are going to nestle between the iron elements. So they'll, this would be interstitial. They're taking, they're, they're taking up residence within the lattice structure. That's one way you can do uh, alloy, interstitial alloying. The other is substitutional. Here you have atoms that are slightly larger, they're closer to the size of the atoms that you're mixing it with, and so it's substitutional. They bump those atoms out of the way and they take their place. So this would be substitutional alloying. So remember that bullet, it will be on your test, interstitial substitution, Pardon me, interstitial alloying and substitutional alloying. Okay. Metal solidification, let's stay on the board here. When weld metal begins to solidify, it will do so from the cold surface of the parent metal in towards the center, and it forms these grains. I think your book calls them columns or columnar structures and they'll, they'll form into the center until the whole thing solidifies. Um, sometimes it sets up stresses here in the center because it, it starts to solidify here on the outside and it puts stress on the still mushy interior 
and it can cause what they call center, uh, center bead cracking here. Uh, depends on the, on, the, on the geometry of the weld and the weld nugget, but be aware that since they do solidify from the edge to the center, this is the last area to solidify, and so you can get cracking in there sometimes. Um, so know that it, it weld metal solidifies from the outside in. Let's turn the page and go to 190. Uh, thermal expansion on heating, thermal contraction on cooling. Whenever you heat a piece of steel, here this is this symbolizes a, a tungsten electrode, and they're heating it, uh, heating up a bar of steel, and uh, the heat's radiating out. You can see how it's radiating it out, and then it be becomes a liquid in here, and what's it's doing? It it's because of the, the, uh, the expansion, it's pushing out on these sides. As it pushes out on the sides, it tends to bow it a little bit, and then the heat continues to go on out some, and then as it starts to cool, the metal contracts. As the metal contracts, it bows it back in the other direction, and there are residual stresses left in the weld when we're done. Uh, if I were to take and, and clamp this down, the residual stresses would be even worse. By allowing it to flex some, it actually reduces the stresses somewhat. And there's a number of ways you can reduce these stresses. Uh, these residual stresses will set in the weld and, unless you do remove them. Uh, welding stresses, they will remain after welding is completed. They can cause distortion. They can cause cracking. Residual stress can be as high as the yield strength. And if that's the case, what's going to happen? It's going to fail. And it's relieved by three methods. Well, I didn't put that in here. The three methods are, uh, are tempering, vibratory stress relief, and, and heating. You can post-weld heat treat it. So on page 191, I would like you... To highlight where it says, in summary, put a bullet there and, and highlight, in summary, the region adjacent to the weld is always characterized by coarse grains, which is followed by a region where the grains are highly refined. Uh, cold work steels have a second region where the grain structure has been refined, which does not exist in steel that has not been cold worked. The region in which the, the large grains exist is less ductile than the fine grain region, and the other regions uh, where smaller grains exist, unless they are very severely cold worked. Bullet, an advantage of multiple pass welding is that the following pass refines the grain in the previous pass. The second pass of a, of a two pass weld in mild steel will, for example, refine the grains in the first. They call that a tempering. Um, we'll get back to this other, the, these stresses here in just a minute. My slides were apparently out of order. Um, they call those tempering beads, and, it's, and people have asked me a number of times, uh, well, Uncle Bob said that, that I, had to, I had to make this weld, and I could only, it had to be capped in three passes, okay? And we had, well, the welding procedure doesn't say so. Uncle Bob says so. Well, Uncle Bob, you didn't write the procedure. The only reason you would have, have to do a weld in a particular sequence is for the purpose that your book is talking about right now, for tempering purposes so that it will stress relieve the previous weld and they call them tempering beads uh, and there's actually procedures for doing that otherwise it takes as many welds as it takes to fill it but just know that when you're welding of course you're setting up stresses as we as we've just discussed but by welding over that with in a multi-pass weld you're re-annealing the previous weld and therefore you're relieving some of the stresses that were set up in that weld and those are called tempering beads so that would be a bullet. It will be on your test. And then over on the next page it says, um, the weld will consist of a fine grain lower bead and a coarse grain upper bead. Therefore, it will have better ductility than a single pass weld. So that's one of the important uh, reasons for that. And now finally we're getting to residual stresses. Uh, talked about, I showed my slides, we talked about it a little bit. If you go to the second paragraph, highlight where it's, uh, last sentence, highlight where it says residual stresses can be relieved by heat treatment, by physically removing a section of the metal, or by yielding, that is distortion of the weld metal. Uh, you can peen it. 
And I'm not talking about taking a chip and hammer and go pop, 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 but I mean vibratory stress relieving, they call it. And you sit there and you really get on it and you can, you can relieve the, some of those stresses that are built up in that manner. Allowing it to give will release some of the manners, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the stresses, or more commonly, you will stress relieve it by post weld heat treating it. PWHT is it's how it's abbreviated. Um, go to page 195, and on the last sentence on that page, it says the residual tensile stress in the weld bin tends to pull on the plates to which it is attached, and in doing this, sets up residual tensile stresses in the plate. Um, so it's these residual stresses that have to be relieved. And if you look at some of the examples that they're giving you here in figure 1120, uh, it's bowing up, that's relieving those stresses. In, in example C, they're locked in place. So those stresses cannot be relieved. They're going to remain in there, uh, which could lead to weld failure if you don't relieve them in some manner. Over on uh, the next page, 197, this is distortion occurring from fillet welds. Well, if you look at A, uh, they put in a fillet weld on one side and it's pulled that vertical plate off center. Uh, to correct that, you could do something that, they, that is called presetting, and that is you could take it, instead of having it straight up and down, you could set it back a little bit, make your weld, and it will pull it back into alignment. Uh, but again, uh, anytime you're welding, anytime you're heating and adding, adding heat to, uh, to, to metal, it's going to expand uh, upon cooling, it's going to contract, and that is always stresses. You have to relieve those stresses in, in some manner, and you would leave the, relieve them by tempering, uh, by vibratory stress relief, or by heat treating. Um, that's it. If you have any questions on that, let me know. I'd be happy to talk to you. I also have some uh, uh, other information on, on welding metallurgy and uh, properties of metals if you're interested, if you'd like to, like to delve into that subject a little deeper. If you have any questions, please find me, and thanks for your attention.